Humanity's transition into the Jet Age forced every military on Earth to reimagine itself from the ground up. If a given nation was lucky, then it had just come into possession of a weapon that far outstripped anything that its prior generation of aircraft could do in the sky. If a given nation was unlucky, then it knew damn well that it would be staring across a battlefield at those jets one day and would have to take them on in some way, somehow. But as world-changing as the transition from prop planes to jets might have been, so too did everything change yet again when the advanced nations of the world moved on from first-generation jet technology into a new and far more advanced stage of aeronautics. With pilots no longer constrained to unwieldy flying bricks and weapons and aerodynamic engineering advancing leaps and bounds each year, the aircraft a given nation developed in the jet ages second and third generations would distinguish the countries who could entertain a real hope at dominating the battlefield from the ones still playing primary school footy after class. In the late 1970s, neither Italy nor Brazil was about to be left behind in this next chapter of the jet race, and rather than simply going it alone and leaving themselves little chance to catch up with the world's great powers, they decided to band together with a singular objective, to create a strike attack aircraft that could hold its own alongside planes like the American A-10, the Soviet Su-25, and the European Jaguar. Italy and Brazil's addition to the mix was the AMX International, better known today as the A11 Ghibli. Now, we said it a moment ago, and we got to say it again here, there is a big difference between the aircraft that came out of the first few years of the jet age and the aircraft that would eventually rise to take their place. And by the early 1970s, that was a lesson that Italy knew all too well. Relying on the Aerotalia Fiat G91, a plane that was certainly pretty decent in its heyday, but had become badly outdated in the intervening years, Italy had no illusions that if it were in a position to deploy strike fighters against an enemy that had an air force of its own, then they'd be badly outmatched. The the only supplement that Italy had for those strike fighters were reconnaissance versions of the Lockheed F-104 Starfighter, a plane whose best days had passed a full decade or more before the moment in history that we're discussing today. And for Italy, the potential need to deploy strike fighters was far more than just an abstract possibility. Sitting at a strategically significant location on the Mediterranean and staring eastward at the nearby Iron Curtain enshrouding Soviet territory, Italy understood that it had to maintain some sort of military readiness in case anything between Europe and the Soviets ever really popped off. After all, if that happens, then Italy would quite likely become one of the first nations in the Soviet Union's crosshairs, making a defense of the Italian homeland all the more critical. An attack aircraft, one that could reliably strike at troop and armor columns while dealing with Soviet MiGs in the sky, would be essential in any plan Italy formed for its own survival. Before we continue today's video, let's talk about something really important, your online privacy. Have you ever Googled yourself and been shocked to see your personal info exposed? I mean, who wants strangers knowing where they live? That's weird. Well, don't worry, Aura's got your back. The internet has something called data brokers. They think that they can make a fortune off your personal information, but not with today's sponsor Aura. Aura identifies those sneaky data brokers exposing your details and hits them with opt-out requests. They legally have to remove your info if you ask them to, but well, that's a lot of effort, so Aura does it for you. And it's not just about fighting off data brokers, Aura is a one-stop shop for online safety, parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, you name it, Aura's got it all at one affordable price. So here's the deal, you can either let people profit off your private info or you can join the Aura squad. Head over to Aura, A-U-R-A dot com slash megaprojects to start your two-week free trial. Thanks to Aura for sponsoring, and now back to today's episode. Across the world, in Brazil, things weren't actually much better. Brazil's attack fighter at that time was actually Italian-made, the Air Mach MB-326, but they too were a product of the mid to late 1950s, and although Brazil hadn't gotten directly involved with many international wars, it was in the midst of dealing with a guerrilla insurgency of its own and hosted a military dictatorship that very clearly understood the importance of showing that they could conduct the sort of airstrikes that the MB-326 just was not capable of. The early hints at a solution for Italy and Brazil's shared problem came from the same company that had supplied Brazil its outdated strike aircraft fleet, Air Machi, who drew up a potential replacement design in the early 1970s and named it the MB-340. When, a few years later, the Italian Air Force realized it needed a new production run of strike fighters, Air Machi had already done the legwork to ensure that they would be a primary candidate for the contract. 
Italy was looking for 187 such strike fighters using an entirely new design rather than trying to graft new capabilities onto the aging G91. And when Amahi wasn't the only company to express interest, Italy opted out of holding a competition for the contract. Instead, Amahi was charged with working alongside the other company that inquired Air Italia and co-producing Italy's latest indigenous aircraft. Design and development work on the plane started in 1978, and it's around this time that Brazil most likely started putting out some feelers in order to see whether the Italians might be interested in a joint venture. Brazil announced its intent to publicly be a part of the project in 1980, and a year after, the Brazilian Embraer Company was invited to the initiative. Britain and Italy nailed down their jointly established criteria, and Air Mackey, Air Italia, and Embraer drew up an outline for the distribution of labor. As they ultimately agreed, Air Italia would handle the plane's center fuselage, stabilizers, and rudders, Air Mackey would handle the front fuselage and the tail cone, and Embraer would take care of the wings, drop tanks, pylons, and air intakes. Each company agreed not to duplicate the work of the others or train personnel in how to perform functions that another company was supposed to be in charge of. That way, all three companies would have to stay solvent and play nice with each other if their fighter aircraft was going to be built at all. Italy would keep their initial order of 187, and Brazil would take home 100 of their own. Italy and Brazil's expectations for this new plane were fairly straightforward. It would have to be survivable to the point that it was mandated to be able to carry on functioning if any single onboard system were to cut out entirely. It would have to be accessible in order for younger or less experienced pilots to be able to fly out on relatively short notice if needed. And finally, it couldn't use key American parts like engines. Both countries knew it would be nice to be able to export their finished product, and both understood the use of certain US-made parts would give the US a say in export controls. But even with all of those constraints, the two partner nations were able to put out a full seven flight-capable prototypes by the mid-1980s, with the first prototype performing its maiden flight on the 14th of May 1984. The program would be marked by tragedy shortly after, when that same prototype crashed in an accident, killing its pilot. But luckily for everyone else involved, that fatal accident would be the only one of the program which otherwise finished its testing runs without issue. Production aircraft began being assembled and delivered all in the span of the year 1988, and it entered service in Italy for the very first time a little over a year later in the Grappo 51 Stormo. As we mentioned previously, the plane was officially branded under the name AMX International, but it became far better known across the world by its designation in Italy, the A11. Its nickname, the Ghibli, oh, was taken not from the Japanese animation studio that had opened its doors just four years prior to the A11's entrance to service, but instead it was named for Ghibli, the hot, dry wind that blows across the deserts of Libya. Just for the record, that's what Studio Ghibli owes its name to as well. You're welcome for that fun fact. Now, at an overall length of 13.2 meters or 45 and a half feet, and with a width of just 8.9 meters, 29 feet, the Ghibli is one of the most slender attack aircraft out there, built with much less of a broad low and slow profile like the American A-10 or the Soviet Su-25, and with a greater focus on both nimbleness and an ability to linger over hot zones for greater durations. It's got a high swept wing, a modern set of targeting and digital communications technologies, and a user-friendly utilitarian cockpit with frequent updates. At a top speed of 1,053 kilometers an hour or 654 miles per hour, it's not quite supersonic, but it's more than quick enough to handle the demands of an intense combat zone, while slow enough to be able to pick off enemy combatants with precision instead of just overflying them in the blink of an eye. The Ghibli came with an empty weight of 6,700 kilograms, a little over seven tons, and could carry very nearly double its own weight. Without drop tanks, it had a combat range of just under 900 kilometers or 550 miles, giving nearly an hour of flight time per takeoff, and it boasted a service ceiling of 43,000 feet or 13,000 meters, an altitude it could reach in just barely four minutes flat. In terms of armament, the Italian version came equipped with a 20 mm Gatling gun, while the Brazilian version was fitted with two 30 mm cannons. The planes had five external hardpoints, which could be utilized to carry rocket pods, guided or unguided bombs, and air to surface missiles. On the two wingtip rails, the Ghibli could carry either two air-to-air -air missiles for self-defense, or even more air-to-ground armament depending on the needs of the mission. In addition to the weapons, the Ghibli can attach external fuel tanks, or optical reconnaissance pods that convert it into a spy plane. The plane's avionics were, for their time, rather advanced, with computerized navigation and attack systems, and the actual equipment used for those avionics was situated low in the plane, allowing it to be maintained or fixed up without the use of ladders or other supports. The Ghibli came equipped with a fly-by-wire system, a relatively new innovation at the time, but also 
with all the requisite tools to switch the Ghibli fully back to manual control, to the point that it could still be flown if the plane's hydraulic systems completely failed. The aircraft features a number of key system duplications and redundancies, so that if an onboard system is knocked out, a backup can kick in, and has got additional protection on the subsystems the engineers in charge deem too vital to lose. Unlike other ground attack planes of the time, the Ghibli didn't invest in heavy cockpit armor for its pilot's safety. Instead, this was deemed too costly, a decision that we imagine was much to the chagrin of the people who actually ended up flying the thing. Now, like other strike and ground attack planes of the late Cold War era, the Ghibli can be somewhat easily outshined by very high-performance, supersonic, extremely well-armed interceptor craft, but competing with those airplanes wasn't exactly the point. The Ghibli was built for a very different role, to strike ground targets quickly and precisely, but even when compared to other planes of its era that were supposed to do the same thing, the Ghibli still stands out for one main reason – its operational versatility. The Ghibli was built to operate just as well in austere environments, where a small group or a pack of Ghiblis might have to defend themselves against aerial interceptor craft as they would in environments where a larger Italian or Brazilian force could provide overwatch and allow them to do their work in peace. They were built to ensure that the plane could take a whole lot of punishment before going down, relying on the pilot to trust the plane rather than sacrificing elements of the plane to protect the pilot. They were fast, they were nimble and aerodynamic at high speeds, but they were built with the express understanding that they wouldn't ever go supersonic. After all, they were designed to operate in low-altitude combat and stay alive and airworthy, and going supersonic simply isn't a useful contribution to their mandate. It's built to deal with any adversity that comes its way by land, air or sea and maintain pursuit of its primary mission for as long as is physically possible. Even without its versatility, the Ghibli was fair competition on paper for both the American A-10 and the Soviet Su-25. It was faster than both of those competitor crafts with a significantly longer range than the A-10 and a significantly higher service ceiling than the Su-25. Although it lacked the ability to conduct low-speed attacks at nearly stalled speed like its competitors, it was far better equipped to handle the demands of a dogfight or other challenges that might be thrown at it when it was deployed without an escort. Where it really suffered in comparison was in both a smaller number of hardpoints and a significantly lower maximum takeoff weight, meaning a lower capacity to carry heavy bombs as well as a relative lack of pilot protection. But even these were acceptable trade-offs when juxtaposed against the missions that the Ghibli was expected to fly. Not asserting Italian or Brazilian power from far-flung forward airbases, but defending against political military action on their own territory, where the ability to complete missions, turn around very quickly, and get back into the skies to respond to a changing battlefield are far more important than simply dropping a bomb load over a static enemy target. The Ghibli first saw action in the Italian Air Force. Flying over Bosnia in 1995 was part of an ongoing effort to support peacekeepers in the Balkans. Although both the Brazilian and Italian planes were grounded on and off through the early 1990s due to multiple planes suffering engine failures, they didn't miss much in what would have been a relatively quiet period for them anyway. Their first real test, performing their strike aircraft role, came in the Kosovo War of 1999. During that conflict, they successfully dropped dozens of bombs on ground targets, sustaining zero losses in return. The Ghibli would next see action in Afghanistan, when four Italian planes were destroyed to assist coalition operations in the region for a total duration of about five years. Despite the small number of planes dispatched, the Ghiblis in that theater would perform over 700 combat sorties in the span of just barely a year. During that conflict in particular, the Ghibli was critical in providing real-time data to ground troops, coordinating air intelligence with land-based operations in a way that wasn't yet common in global combat. Then, in 2011, Italy deployed several Ghiblis to Libya, where they dropped hundreds of bombs on targets affiliated to the regime of Muammar Gaddafi, who was, at the time, in the process of being deposed. But as successful as the Ghibli was during those conflicts, they were, nonetheless, the only conflicts where the Ghibli has ever played a role at a large scale. They've proven their worth in carrying out the task in front of them, certainly, but since they've only ever done the relatively safe work of attacking ground targets while protected by coalition air power, their real claim to fame, their operational versatility, is untested at this time. With that lack of real-world exposure has come a lack of export buyers. Venezuela wanted eight, but was blocked by the US and the Philippines showed some interest for a short while, but abandoned it in order to pursue the Korean-made F-A-50 supersonic attack plane. Other than that, the clamoring auction Brazil and Italy hopes they'd create for the Ghibli has never actually been realized. And now, with the plane really getting on in its service life, 
it seems unlikely that any new buyers are going to emerge. The plane has seen uses in humanitarian contexts, aiding with reconnaissance in response to volcanic eruptions and earthquakes, and its 18,000 hours of flight time and live operations have long since broken the Italian Air Force's record. But it still served only limited roles in the war context for which it was intended. As of today, the Ghibli still serves faithfully with the Italian and Brazilian air forces, with 40 aircraft still in service in Italy and 59 in Brazil, most of which have been modernized somewhat to keep up with the times. It's getting old, and it risks being surpassed by fifth-generation fighter models that can fill a ground attack role. As such, it should be no surprise that Italy plans to retire what remains of its Ghibli fleet in the next couple of years, although Brazil intends to keep at least a few models around until the early 2030s. In Italy, it'll be replaced by modern multi-role fighters like the F-35 Lightning, while in Brazil, it'll hand over its duties to the Swedish-made JAS-39 Gripen fighter. In both nations, the Ghibli will leave behind a legacy not of battlefield victories or even much battlefield participation at all, but it'll still be remembered for its deeply relevant contributions to both its parent nations. It is and was a defender of homelands, a powerful demonstration that both Brazil and Italy were not to be challenged, and a reminder to the people of both nations that even without becoming subservient to either of the Cold War's major powers, they could guarantee their own safety and security for decades to come. The fact that Italy and Brazil have both continued to thrive well into the 21st century is perhaps all the humble A11 Ghibli needs to call its grand mission a resounding success. 